Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, and this is another video production from the DCC Guide. So let's go ahead and take a look at finishing up what I've been talking about as far as these boosters go. Because I got a number of questions from folks after the last uh, video that I did on boosters, and uh, you know, I wanted to address those uh, in this video. So hang around and we'll get started. Okay, one of the questions that came up right off was about the last issue that I talked about, which was grounding boosters and command stations to one another, and also how to make connections between them. So what I want to do is focus down here on the bench top and look at a couple of, uh, a couple of examples uh, that I've got here to show you exactly how to do that. So hang in there. What I have here then is a DCS-210 uh, Digitrex command station and a DB-150 uh, booster. And what I want to do is show you how to make uh, the proper connections between these. Now, on other systems, there will be a similar type of arrangement, uh, but I obviously I can't show them all. I don't own them all, but I'll, I'll give you some tips uh, along the way. And what I'm going to show you is pretty much what is recommended for NCE, and, and you know, you're going to find this uh, with others. Uh, obviously, uh, with some of them, the ground connection you won't be making, but um, other than that, we'll go ahead and take a look. Okay, so the first thing you want to notice here is I've got this standard uh, six-wire local net cable, and I've shown you how to make those in the past in previous videos. And um, as you can see, they're just daisy chain from one uh, from the command station to the booster. Now the reason you need this is is it transmits the uh, DCC signal from the command station to the booster. So that's how the booster gets that DCC signal and then boosts it to the volume uh, to the uh, voltage and the amperage that you want uh, for your track and then it sends it out to the track. Now I've uh, eliminated uh, the uh, the power connections and the track connections uh, in this setup to make it a lot easier to figure out or to see what I'm doing here. Okay, so then basically you've got this short cable going between the command station and the booster, and then I've got the ground wire here that goes between the, the ground terminal here and the ground terminal here. So that is for your reference ground, and I talked about it in the previous video. Now you also notice a small green jumper right here. Now, on this, this is a DB150, and it could also be used as a command station uh, in some setups. And in order to turn off the command station functions, all you have to do is put this um, uh, jumper between config A and the ground, and that will make this operate only as a booster. Now, on some systems, on the newer systems, uh, they do not have that capability, they don't include the config, so what you do is you can go into, for example, this uh, DB210, uh, you can go in and change an internal um, software switch that will uh, make this a, uh, a booster and disable the command station functions. Now, it's very uh, easy to set these up. Now, the one thing though is, when these two are sitting close together, Obviously, you only need these short uh, cables and wires to make the connection. But what if you have these at different ends of the model railroad? For example, on, on the Piedmont Southern, you know, mine are going to be 60 feet apart. So what, am I, what do I do? Well, you run a 60-foot uh, loco net cable between them, and you, you run a 60-foot ground wire between them. The obvious question is, why can't you just, you know, make these connections off of the... Um, Net, the local net network for the throttles. I uh, have never seen a di Digitrex diagram that recommends doing that. Everyone I've ever seen showed a separate connection between the command station and the boosters. Uh, and you can go ahead and daisy chain more of these boosters like this. So I always have, uh, have gone with a separate uh, cable connecting the command station and the booster. 
And I assume that that should be uh, also true for other systems, but that's another case. Check with tech support, check your manuals, see what they say as far as making these type of connections. And of course, the ground wire is going to be a separate ground. Always use, you know, a, a dedicated ground wire. Now, another thing that I want to tell you about this particular cable here is it is polarity sensitive. So you have to be very careful and make sure that you get this made up right. So take a look back at the uh, video that I did on how to make up cables, and I'll put a link to that uh, above me here. And uh, make sure you always get this made up correctly. And if you don't, then what you will see is the polarity of the track output from this booster will be the opposite of the polarity of the track output from the command station. So what you'll have to do is either redo the the uh, the connections and create a new cable, or you can just you know flip the uh, the wires that go out from track A and track B uh, to the track, and that's a quick and dirty fix. In the long run, you're probably better to get this correct the first time, or to keep it or or to fix it if you screw it up uh, the first time. Go ahead and fix it because. In the future, when you start troubleshooting, or somebody else is doing troubleshooting, they might not know, or you might forget about the uh, the reversal here in these wires. Another thing to be aware of uh, is track polarity uh, outputs from the uh, command station and the boosters themselves, because you've got a track A and a B here and here on the uh, on the command station and the booster, and you always need to make sure that track A. Uh, on the command station and the booster go to the same rails even though they're you know blocked in separate uh, blocks you still have to have them going to the same rails so track A for example might go towards the aisle it might be connected to the rails closest to the aisle whereas track B might be or, or power B uh, would be connected to the uh, the rear rail or the one against the backdrop, let's say. So track A towards the aisle, track B towards the backdrop. So that's a quick way to remember uh, the polarity connections. Now another comment I made uh, the other day was, or in that previous video, was about the fact that you can uh, change uh, the uh, actual output voltage to the track. So I want to go ahead and show you how to do that. This is a DCS-200 uh, command station, but you know, in, in all of these uh, previous systems, um, they followed pretty much the same type of, of pattern. I'm not sure whether or not you can do this in the newer, you know, uh, DB uh, or DCS-210 and 240 systems, but I know that it's, you know, this is true for the older uh, boosters and command stations that Digitrax made. So let me show you how this works. Okay, first I'm going to turn it, uh, turn the power on here. Okay, so it powered up, and you can see we've got uh, track power output here because that orange light is our track status light here. And so first, let's see how do you actually measure the voltage. And this is right out of the Digitrax manual. All you have to do is set this for DC volts and then uh, put one probe on the ground, okay? And then the other probe tip on rail A, and you can see we're uh, at seven and a half volts, okay, 7.512, then do the other one. And that one is 7.52, so very good, very close, balanced signal. Now if you add those two, you'll find that it's 15 volts. So that's the power that you're getting towards uh, to the right to the rails now that is under that's a no load voltage and that's what Digitrax recommends uh, that you do a no load voltage measurement and the voltage is obviously going to change over, uh, uh, once you put a load on but what you can do here is I'm going to do this so that I don't cook myself in the, the device let me show you right in here not sure if it's visible but right in between here there is a trim pot okay uh, it's between these switches and this connector here. I need to go back out some in order to get that in. Okay, I can take this all the way down to seven point, roughly 7.3 volts, and I can take it on up to nine and a quarter volts. So we can, we've got a pretty good range on this one. I'm gonna take it back down to 7.5 where it was. 
so that it'll still be balanced with the other one. So it was 7.512, something like that. Okay, and it's a simple matter to just take two screws off the top, and there's two screws on the bottom, and then the case just slides right off, and you can check that, uh, you can uh, make that adjustment. Uh, the powerhouse systems, that NCE cells, have a similar type of arrangement that allows you to adjust the track voltage. So hopefully that will uh, allow you to make these kind of adjustments. And you should always do that so that your uh, booster and your command station are at as, as close to uh, a, a, the same voltage as you can get as you can get them. Because you, you want a good balanced power source going out to your locomotives and, um, and, and, and that's the safest way to go about it. So the question, one question that came up uh, for me was, how do I know how many boosters I'm going to need? And uh, how do I know whether I need to buy another booster at all? Well, the easiest way to do that is to calculate the number of locomotives that are going to be operating at any one time on your model railroad. And then multiply that by the uh, uh, average current that they're going to be drawing. Now, one of the best places that you can get that kind of information, though, is from model railroad or uh, product reviews, because they always provide uh, a value for the initial uh, current that the, lo that the uh, locomotive pulls, and they'll also give you a value uh, at the stall current and at the uh, slipping current. So you've got several different measures of the maximum current draw that you're going to see. Probably the slipping is go going to be the maximum and the worst case scenario that you'll find. But what you do is you go ahead and take those values and multiply them times the number of locomotives of that type that you have and add it all together. And that uh, value will tell you how many amps you have to provide for your locomotives at any one time, okay? You don't have to do it for every locomotive you own, just the number that you expect to be operating simultaneously on the model railroad at any one time. And uh, that value will probably be much smaller than what your booster already is or what your command station already puts out. But don't forget though, you also have to, uh, if you've got uh, lit passenger cars that you operate and cabooses on your model railroad, you have to add the amperage that each one of those draws. For, an, for a single LED, it's probably 20 milliamps. If you have uh, some of these lit cars from, uh, from Walther's and others, you're going to need to try to figure out how much they draw. And I can't be much help to you there because they vary all over the place. Um, light bulbs are another source. If, if they're not LEDs, you might have light bulbs. Uh, light bulbs vary anywhere from around 20 to 40 milliamps each. And there might be some that draw more than that. So you need to uh, account for those as well. Finally, another uh, source of power that, that might be drawing on your boosters and command stations are accessory decoders. If you are using accessory decoders to power your switch machines, to power lights in your buildings, any other fancy devices that you might have, you need to know how much each one of those is drawing. You need to add all of that stuff into the total because everything that is drawing from your DCC power uh, bus is going to be, you know, applied against that output from your booster. So what you need to do is add all that together, compare it to the booster that you have or the command station output you have, and then you'll know whether or not you need to add an additional booster. Uh, now, another thing to keep in mind, even if you have a five or an eight or a 10 amp booster, it probably can only put out about three amps continuous. That's basically how these things work. And if you look at the fine print in the instruction manuals on the specs, it will tell you that. However, as I've told you in previous videos on keeping your boosters and, and equipment cool and, you know, building an enclosure for your, for your equipment, all of that, if you provide a fan blowing directly on your boosters or if you put them in an enclosure that's cooled by fans, uh, then they can typically operate at a much, much higher amperage. You know, they might even be able to operate all day long at the 5 amps or 8 amps or 10 amps that they're capable of putting out. Uh, 
It just depends on how cool you're able to keep these because internally they have a temperature dependent circuit breaker. And when the temperature goes above a certain uh, value, then they will shut down. And when they shut down, they're going to shut your booster and your command station down. And the only way to avoid that is keeping these cool. Well, I hope that answered uh, the various questions that y'all had in regards to using boosters, how many boosters you need, and how do you wire them, the whole nine yards. So uh, that's a wrap for this week. On Monday, I want to start off in a different direction, and I need to do a video on uh, on uh, installing a decoder in a Cato uh, locomotive that I did for the uh, September 2020 issue of Model Railroader, so we'll take a look at that. And then uh, we've got some other things that I'd like to, to do uh, uh, next week. So uh, have a great weekend, wear your mask, and stay healthy. Bye now.